Uh, Renee was originally scheduled to be on a panel with us today, and with her appointment as the ARPA-H director, <clears throat> we thought it would be a great opportunity to hear about her priorities for the new agency and future innovation in medicine and health. Renee joined ARPA-H from Ginkgo Bioworks and Concentric by Ginkgo, where she focused on applying synthetic biology against infectious disease challenges. She's also a familiar face to many of us at DARPA from her time at the agency, uh, where she led programs that use synthetic biology and gene editing to enhance biosecurity, uh, support, support the domestic bioeconomy, and counter bio threats. And maybe most notably, uh, she also earned her um, bachelor's and doctoral degrees in applied biology right here at Georgia Tech. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wegerson in conversation with DARPA's communications chief, Tabitha Thompson. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for, for being here today. Um, just a, a quick note to those who are in the audience or online, we will be accepting questions uh, during this fireside chat via the virtual event platform. If you don't have it loaded, um, you can scan the QR code on the screen to get to it. Um, but we'll start with a couple of questions off the bat. Again, thank you for being yeah, thanks here. Thanks for having me. Really <laughs> excited to be back here with DARPA family, but also launching ARPA-H. Day 12 that I'm <laughs> in office, so really, thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So you mentioned this already, but you spent several years at DARPA where we've reiterated, you heard Stephanie say it, other people say it throughout the day yesterday, that we embrace and even celebrate failure as a route to breakthroughs. So would be curious what your philosophy is about failure and how that informs your approach at DARPA H. Yeah, I think you know failure is such a big part of the culture of, of DARPA, but in a, in a way that failure is celebrated and not um, held against the program managers. They're really allowed to explore their ideas and go for those very you know high risk, high reward um, uh, science and advances. And so ARPA H must do the same thing. And so part of uh, the priorities for me starting out are creating that culture together with um, the folks that have really built this vision for, for ARPA-H. We're lucky to have Adam Russell, who used to be um, a DARPA program manager, to really uh, take the lead as acting director to stand up the agency. And um, it's been great to see him work with the staff at HHS uh, Health and Human Services, where, where um, uh, ARPA-H is, to let them know, okay, failure's okay, you know, don't worry about it. We're gonna experiment, we're gonna try new things with this organization, um, and we're gonna learn from that failure, importantly, um, and, and have that so we're always growing and iterating and expanding as we, as we grow as an organization. A few other organizations have adopted the DARPA model uh, or the approach to innovation in the past, but each one has sort of carved out its own trail based on the focus, the area of expertise or discipline. Are there unique aspects you think of the health space that inform the ARPA-H model? In particular, absolutely. So uh, obviously, health is is the the cornerstone of of ARPA H, and really focused on what are the breakthrough technologies, not for national security, but instead to advance positive health health outcomes for the American people. So we need to be um, really. There's this urgency, especially in, on the on the back end of the pandemic, uh, where folks understand the incredible power of biology that can, can change not only uh, you know, mortality and outcomes for American health, but actually have an impact on the economy and, and beyond. And so with that type of urgency, really pushing forward to say, what are the grand challenges in health that we wanna be using the ARPA model to accelerate uh, and do things that the, the the ecosystem that's there for health now. So NIH, HHS, CDC, um, all important partners in this ecosystem, but can't fundamentally do the things that an ARPA can do. Okay. And then a few of the big problems. So you mentioned, you know, what are, what are the challenges? So what are some of the big problems that you are looking at tackling um, through ARPA-H? Yeah, so um, my other big priority, of course, is to hire the program managers that everybody here is familiar with, with the, the ARPA model. So uh, we are not a, going to be a top-down agency that dictates this is the science that we're going to work on. Um, we are in a sprint to find the program managers that are gonna come on board um, and they're really this unicorn of, of a person that has this incredible idea and a well-defined problem in health that they want to tackle without a preconceived notion of how to do it. 
um, but are willing to, to, to take that jump, but then also be the person that wants to come on board and be able to execute that. So, so the first like kind of call to arms is uh, we will, we're looking for program managers to bring those ideas to shape what ARPA-H is. Um, if you look at, let's say, the National Cancer Institute, 20 years ago, NCI worked on cancer. Today they work on cancer. 20 years from now, they're going to work on cancer. ARPA-H, I hope every time people check in today, a year from now, five years from now, it's going to look a little bit different because of those program managers. And that's very much been my experience at DARPA. We want to recreate that for, for health. So we, we innovate and stimulate technology, but then have to diffuse it out of the agency. That said, there are some, I think, uh, major technical levers that we see uh, as being the places that, that really have an opportunity to, to, to change momentum in health. And so I'll just highlight four of those for you. Um, one is prevention. So uh, if we start and are trying to detect disease, it's easier to detect a tumor at the one cell stage and treat it than, than once, once you have a metastasis. So what are the technologies um, and innovations that are gonna get there, for example? Um, tools and platforms. So what are the new molecular tools? What are the societal tools? What are the hardware tools, the, the foundry type of uh, formats that we can invest in and really be creating a toolkit for all diseases? We want to be able to address cancer and Alzheimer's disease, but also create a way that, that we can access rare diseases in a, in a more nimble fashion than we can today. Scale is going to be really important. So, uh, if you just look at the pandemic, it was really tremendous to see, um, you know, some initial work funded by NIH to show proof of concept on uh, mRNA vaccines. Dan Wattendorf, the program manager at DARPA, pulled it together and said, "This is how we're going to really accelerate and, and bring industry together to, to make mRNA vaccines and gene encoded antibodies a reality." And then when the pandemic came, that groundwork had been done so that you could actually scale. But those initial investments in scale had not. Um, well, there weren't investments in scale, it was real time uh, responding, right. we need billions of doses. And so how do we build in from programs at the beginning thinking about designing products um, and user experiences that are going to be ready to scale? This also touches on um, equity that we want to be uh, addressing with, with ARPA-H, so, so really getting it to the, the, the greatest number of people possible. Um, and then finally, uh, resilient systems. So what I've observed um, in my, my last post in industry, what was really fascinating to me at Ginkgo Bioworks standing up um, concentric by Ginkgo, where we went from a team of about a dozen people to about 300 during, during my time there, really focused on um, biosecurity and responding to the pandemic. Um, during that time, it wasn't that we were using the foundry to innovate. We were taking a lot of off-the-shelf solutions that had not yet been integrated into a platform to then deliver health at scale. And so I'm really excited about the innovation coming out of DARPA, coming out of the rest of HHS, the industry and the community um, to build those resilient systems where you can integrate them for, to, again, improve health outcomes for the American people. Yeah, I think uh, we talked a little bit about commercialization yesterday and how important that is and that, yeah. those conversations being open. And then for you know those who are here with us in the room or those who are online, um, you know, following along uh, via the virtual event platform, is there, you mentioned those, you know, your thrust, your focus areas, how can, a, you know, in addition to being a program manager, how can people sort of be involved or where do you see people joining you in these spaces? Yeah, so I, I think um, program managers first and foremost. So uh, we, we've, it's a, it, you know, our page is very much a startup, and so um, we're we're also uh, a startup with a billion dollars to spend, which is pretty amazing, and and being able to lean on NIH and HHS to stand up our infrastructure, and so. We need the program managers in place with those well-defined problems to, to launch. But those folks can come from industry. They can come from academia. They can come from government. Um, so that's, that's the primary way we can start um, working together. Once program managers have launched those programs, uh, perform our community, of course, who, who the, the, the grantees, the people who are funded, um, we want to be engaging all of those, those sectors as well. And so um, a lot of people are sending us ideas. We don't even have a website or an open BAA yet. Um, so so uh, coming soon, keep, keep, uh, keep an eye out for, for that launch, but really is early days. But um, please do contact us, share your ideas. Um, I would love feedback on you know, some of these thrust areas that, that, that we're thinking about because we wanna make sure that, that we're really leaning into where, where that innovation is. Um, one other thing I, I will say, at, at DARPA, um, you know, 
best job I ever had, uh, really, with that ability as a program manager to, to leverage resources and, and address challenges, be it, not afraid to fail, but uh, really push the envelope was, was so exciting. Um, but at the same time, really needing to figure out how do you transition things out of the agency. So that, that was, um, I, I was excited after DARPA to go to industry to see, okay, how do, what does it look like on the other end? Yeah. And so um, I, I, I really encourage industry to be helping us think about um, what do you need to see in order to commercialize this and, and bring this to scale? Um, because it's not something that, that is intuitive to every, every performer that, that we work with. Right, okay, no, that's helpful. And then. You know, as far back as 2017, people have started talking about an ARPA for health. So why is why do you think now is the right time, or what what do you th what do you think is in the the air that makes this the moment? Yeah, I, I remember those early days where it was a little bit of a whisper um, and an idea of an ARPA H. And uh, starting about a year and a half ago or so, I was working with a group in the White House. Um, really, just they were talking to everybody like who who knew a little bit about the ARPA model and, and what I felt in these conversations. Um, that was new was really this, this urgency following um, the pandemic, understanding again this powerful biology, how are we going to be ready for the next threat, um, but understanding just this incredible concept of mRNA vaccines, what, what is success of that pandemic? I mean, it had not been used at scale um, but before we were fighting COVID-19 and, and the world came together, um, brought it to scale and made it happen. And so it, it really showed a lot of people, I think, the art of what was possible in health. And so I, I do think that that really increased the momentum um, to go well beyond um, what uh, for COVID-19. The other thing that happened, so when President Biden came into office, um, he really reinvigorated the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. And so this was, um, you know, he had started that when he, when he was vice president and coming back, this really became one of the priorities of, of his presidency. Um, ARPA H is part of the moonshot, so uh, we'll be working very closely with uh, the National Cancer Institute, where we'll have the subject matter experts that are really focused on understanding those cancer and diseases um, on the ARPA H side. Our contributions can be on the tools and platforms to help enable what are the next advances in cell therapies or molecular therapies, or or even tr treating patients, so you don't have to fill in a uh, when you get to the doctor's office, like you know the form that everybody has to fill in every time your your medical history, right? Like how do we look at the problem? problems all along that, that platform and, and create solutions. Okay, that's helpful. And then having been a DARPA program manager, you have great insight into this, the DARPA, <laughs> approach for biological technologies. So could you talk a little bit about collaboration and you know, sort of where you see that with DARPA and ARPA-H moving forward? Yeah, um, I, I think I, I matured over my time as a program manager um, where early days really focused on the technology and um, and engage the stakeholders that didn't always understand what they needed to see at the back end of a program. And so, just like one example, if you're making an enzyme better and it is a thousand X better by the end of the program, it's like not useful always to a stakeholder. It, it needs to be in a, in a currency or a deliverable that is meaningful. And so, um, you heard a bit about the PREPARE program today. What, what we learned in designing that program was actually, if you design a, a road to GMP, so good manufacturing practice, production, scale, and manufacturing, but also a path to regulatory, and that is your final deliverable. That's useful for FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. It's useful for industry. Um, it's useful to a clinic, a, a research clinic that wants to then take that into a clinical trial. And so really listening to those stakeholders early on is going to be such a critical part of, of program development for ARPA-H if we really want to impact our customer. So the customer of DARPA is the warfighter. The customer of ARPA-H is the American people. And so, so getting that last mile is, is really going to be our challenge. And so um, the, the types of uh, federal stakeholders we'll be working with um, include CMS, so the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, who, who help define payments for, for those patients. Um, and then HRSA, which is the Health Resources and, and Services Administration that helps um, connect us with underserved communities. They, they, they provide um, you know, clinical care. And so um, I haven't worked with those communities before, and they're very excited to. They're excited to work with us. Um, but this is going to be an entire ecosystem effort because they'll, they'll, they'll be the ones inheriting it on the, on the back end. And then um, you talked about this a little bit from a program manager standpoint, but logistically, how does one start to work with ARPA-H? Yeah, so um, until our website is live, which is hopefully <laughs> soon, uh, we do have a, an email that's, that's live, so careers at ARPA-H 
at arpa-h.gov. Um, and so you can also reach out to me. And we are uh, looking for program managers that, that have that idea or that well-defined problem um, that are willing to come to ARPA-H. We have a term appointment just like uh, DARPA. It's a three-year uh, term appointment to start renewable for up to six years. And we will ask you uh, the Heilmeier Catechism, which I'm sure you've heard about um, here at DARPA. So the questions, what are you trying to do? What problem are you trying to solve in health? Um, how is it done today? What's different in your approach? Uh, what are the milestones and timeline and, and cost going forward? Um, but we're gonna ask you a couple other uh, questions because we're ARPA-H and the, the H is for, is for health. And so one is, how do you design a program from the beginning? How are you thinking about equity, access, and scale? And so making sure that we are not thinking about the, at the back end of a program where you try to retrofit scale or retrofit equity is, is very challenging to do. How do you do that from the beginning? I'll just give a concrete example. So many clinical trials today are designed for a um, adult white male population, and that is not representative of our country. And so um, how can we as, a, as an organization build into our programs, making sure that, that we have a, a diverse uh, a representation in our clinical trials so that they are relevant to a greater body of the, the population. And then the, the last question that we want you to consider is how can this, uh, maybe it's like from personal experience at DARPA, but how can this program be misunderstood? <laughs> and so, um, we, you know, we, we see a lot of misinformation around vaccines now and, and, um, and healthcare, and we want to make sure that we are getting ahead of that. And um, it's interesting to think, uh, I, was, I was here at, at DARPA during the early days um, when the PROTECT program, which, which was uh, the launching pad for some of these mRNA encoded technologies, um, a conversation that's come up at ARPA-H is what if we had had a partner program at the time to think about how this program might be misinterpreted or how this technology might be misinterpreted and how can we create messaging around it um, to increase science literacy around mRNA encoded vaccines. And that's a big what if question, right. um, but uh, like let's ask that what if now at the beginning, at the beginning of every program is, is something that we're gonna strive to do. Yeah. As a communications person, I appreciate that <laughs> for sure. Um, and you talked about, um, you know, a little bit about what it looks like to work with ARPA H. Sort of thinking about what it will look like to work with DARPA. So how, um, you know, what can future uh, performers expect? This is an audience question. Yeah. Um, expect to work with ARPA H, and then question, when and how can I submit a white paper? I think you gave the email address. I don't know if that's where you want it or? Yes, we, we don't have process. A, a process to accept white papers right now. So with the with the launch of our of our website, they'll be a little bit formal. So right now we are open to chatting about ideas. So so um, you can reach out to me. We have, um, I'll maybe call it my, we have uh, two members of the RPH staff staffer are here today, Arunan and Tom, that, that you can also chat with. But um, maybe they can send some of the contact information. I, I'm happy to, to, to share yeah. out. Um, but that's gonna be the starting place, but uh, as soon as we get all of our contracting capabilities launched, a lot of this, I'll say, was predicated on me being on board. So the authorities that were legislatively given to ARPA-H, again, brand new startup, I had to be in place to sign and launch a lot of these capabilities. And so, so um, the great work of, of Adam and the ARPA-H team before I got on board made it ready so it was kind of push button. So, so coming soon. Um, but we're really eager to, to engage on those topics. And, and we're already looking at the next one here. Yeah. Uh, so DARPA has a reliable transition partner in the military services and defense industrial base. Who do you see as primary transition partners? You talked about this yeah. a little bit uh, for ARPA-H, who will be able to enable full realization of ARPA-H research. It's a great question, and actually, when even when I was in the Biological Technologies Office, um, some of the other offices at, at DARPA have just very clear military transition partners. Um, BTO has transition partners well outside defense, and so I, I do think um, we're, we're going to be sort of doubling down on, on those types of engagements. Um, industry is going to be a, a really important transition partner for us because we want to make sure those technologies end up on shelves and, and, yeah. and available to customers. Um, we have the whole HHS um, uh, medical enterprise, I think, that are also going to be really important transition partners. Um, and, and I would posit that DARPA, in many cases, can be a transition partner. So um, the scope of DARPA really you know, focused on defense 
um, prevented DARPA, when at least when I was in BTO, from working on like pediatric cancers, right, or, or something that's just clearly outside the scope of, um, of, of the defense world, but at ARPA-H, if we're developing a platform technology that could be used for bio threats or something relevant, um, it would be it, it fantastic to collaborate with, with DARPA and, and demonstrate to the world some of these technologies can be used across a, a variety of sectors. Um, just a quick reminder uh, that you can submit questions uh, via the virtual event platform, and if you don't have access to it here in your in the room, um, just scan the QR code. Um, so next, uh, Kadian's question is: What is the most exciting development that you think ARPA H can achieve for science? That's a big one. It's, it's a big <laughs> question, um, but it is really. Um, I think it's it's total blue sky now. Looking for those ideas from program managers, but I'll, I'll just say my, my own experience. Some of the most delightful moments that I had at DARPA was when my fellow program managers would come to the table um, with an idea that I like just floored me. I had not thought about it. And, and one example is um, you know, a surprise that came from Seth Cohen, he's a chemist who's in the biological technologies office who um, had worked on these um, metal organic frameworks and had been thinking about, okay, in, in remote environments, deserts, that um, water is a resource that is a talent, um, is not abundant in the ground or in wells, but is abundant in the atmosphere. And so how can you capture water from the atmosphere to basically fill a canteen or, or create water for you know, industrial purposes? And it just blew my mind. And I was like, this, is, this place is amazing that we allow like, and create an environment where these types of ideas can come forward. Um, the other anecdote there is just mRNA vaccines. So mm -hmm. anybody who's ever worked in lab with, NR, with RNA of any sort, it's, it's, it degrades very quickly. It's difficult to, to handle. And so when, when Dan was like, I think there's a there there, and we, we need to explore this, maybe modifications to the RNA, Moderna was there at the table, um, will help us have stability to, 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 to bring that forward. And you know, there's a lot of people that sincerely doubted <laughs> that that was possible. And so it's really unlocking the art of what's possible. And so um, I don't know what that program is going to be, but I'm, I'm just ready to be surprised for, for the, the concepts that come in from program managers. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, and of course, we heard uh, Dr. Tompkins say yesterday that the mRNA research is one of the reasons we can all be here together. Absolutely. And uh, Seth's program is all atmospheric yeah. water extraction. It's, it's in progress right now, so yeah. that's exciting. So I look forward to seeing what happens there with that first big idea. Um, DARPA is known for aggressive schedules. You've talked about that. You've talked about your aggressive schedule yeah. growing very quickly. Health research has traditionally moved on a much more conservative path, though. So how does ARPA H plan to approach the challenge of reconciling soundness, like all those audiences you have to, to those publics you have to satisfy, um, and expediency? Yeah, I think one of the, the best things that I can do um, as a director of ARPA-H is give ARPA-H a little bit of space to demonstrate the art of what's possible, right? So I, I'm already feeling this in some of the conversations. They're like, oh, that's going to take too long, or, or, you know, this is how long it normally takes. And, um, like, we just we just you know, refuse to accept that notion. And so that's why the timing is now for ARPA-H. And you know, I've uh, really inspired a lot by DARPA in, in the art of what's possible. Um, I think we need to start to show some of those early, um, I wouldn't say early wins, but early demonstrations of here's a schedule of how we're going to approach this and here's why it's possible. We've bought down risk at every phase so, so we can really concretely start to communicate out how we're going to do that. But again, you know, the successes of, of ARPA-H are, 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 are not going to be very visible to the rest of the world for, for several years. It takes right. time to develop these, these programs. Yeah. So it's going to be a balance of communicating out our approach and having satisfaction in that expedient approach yeah. and then results on the back end for sure. And I think that's, you know, that's what we see even, you know, sometimes we see things move quickly um, from concept to actually being available with DARPA, but sometimes we see the seed is planted and then years later we see it, it come up somewhere. So I think that's right. it certainly yeah. will be that way here. So what impact horizon are you targeting? Are you considering high risk basic science that could have a huge impact 20 years from now to that point actually? <laughs> Yeah, again, I, I want to keep emphasizing we need program <laughs> managers in, but, but completely open to some of the fundamental um, science that, that needs to take place to, to, to build 
um, the, the possibility of, of, what's, of what's coming next. And so, um, I, I, absolutely, I mean, I think we are looking at probably more the 10, 20 year horizon, um, but what, are, what is the fundamental research? Also, that's not um, duplicative of research happening somewhere else is gonna be a really important part of, of what we do as we go forward. But um, there's a lot of examples, I, I think, even coming out of DARPA, is, you know, 6-1 to use the, the, the lingo of the DOD, that very early proof of concept uh, development phase, and uh, when we launch, I hope to share some ideas that we have of how do you really nurture some of that basic research um, that's needed to, to, to you know, advance um, some of these capabilities going forward. Okay. Again, if you have uh, questions, you can submit those via the virtual event platform in the room. You can scan the QR code, or if you're online using the platform. Does ARPA-H see itself as an alternative to the traditional pharma industry in areas that might not be commercially viable for those companies? Yeah, so, so an alternative um, in the sense, like obviously uh, for, for folks that don't know, um, ARPA's are offices. We are not labs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, we're not manufacturing facilities, so we're not an alternative uh, you know, producer, but um, in terms of a place to buy down risk, I do think that ARPAs have a really important role um, where it, it, to, to invest in some of that uh, fundamental science that may not be um, commercially viable right. um, is going to be important. And I, I would challenge us too to think about what are ways, especially leading into platforms, that we can rethink um, pharma a little bit. So um, there's antimicrobial resistance is, is a huge challenge because there's not those commercial incentives that are in place to, to bring that forward. And so can ARPA-HB a place to create platforms that there's incentive because in the inherent development of that platform, not only can you reduce, address AMR, but a, a number of other diseases. And so we really wanna be thinking about those types of things. But I don't, I don't have a, because we don't have the programs yet, I don't have a right. concrete answer, but, but I do hope it is a place that we definitely want pharma at the table with us developing some of these concepts. I, I appreciate you saying that too. We even, you know, at DARPA will often have people say, I want to come see your lab. Yeah. <laughs> and the lab is, it's everywhere, right? It's all of our performers. Uh, there's people in the industry and academia, our partners um, in the military services. And I would imagine, you know, some of your, your partners within the health space as well. Um, next question from the audience. Sometimes deploying health solutions at scale means low-tech solutions and fundamental societal changes like more accessible healthy food. Will ARPA-H keep the focus on technology and or policy? Yeah, so this is, um, so we're not a policy organization, just, just period. Um, but what I, I will say in the focus of technology, this is where having a really well-defined problem um, matters. And so why, why can we not get to scale in some cases? And maybe it's because of a fundamental technology. Um, I, I, talking with, with my colleagues at HRSA and CMS, they, they just talked about like a, a lot of people are just hundreds of miles away from the next healthcare facility. And so one way you can solve that is by creating transportation for those folks to get to those clinics. But um, the other way is through bringing that technology, simple technology, in home um, so that it can report back to the clinic that's hundreds of miles away. And so rethinking how we address, define that problem and bring it to where it needs to go to, to, to get that, especially that last mile for scale is what's going to be important. Um, and by creating those solutions, then that's data for policymakers then to think about how they, how they may change or rethink policy or regulation going forward. Uh, next question. To what extent will ARPA-H work to engender public trust in their advancements, given that you mentioned the customer is the American people and that this often requires more than just proof of sound science? Yeah, so this has been um, in, in the, the, the great work in standing up ARPA-H is really thinking about how do we do this? How do we, how do we bring in the customer? And um, you know, I, I'd say hang tight for some of, of the ideas that we want to launch in this area, but we are really trying um, because there's no precedent of an ARPA-H, like literally we're starting from scratch, we, we were able to, I think, engage communities in, in really unique ways. And so whether this is going in person to engage with those communities, whether it's finding some of the key influencers in those communities that um, can, can partner and, and have conversations with ARPA-H, um, these are things that we really want to address and, and help the American people define problems for us as well. So uh, if anybody who's been a program manager at DARPA, you come in with your, as Arthi Provocker would call it, your hair on fire idea. Um, but then once you're there, you, you start to engage with your community and 
understand what are the next challenges that I want to have my second program or my third program. And so it's really through that engagement that, that, that we hope to, once program managers are on board, um, really think about those problems and, and, and bring forward the next solutions. It's always very visual, the hair on fire. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing as preventative medicine is being discussed with reference to ARPA-H, would topics such as regenerative and augmentative medicine be within the scope of the project, especially with regard to targeting development in the combat performance industry? So I, I would say that regenerative and augmented medicine absolutely would, would be within the scope of ARPA-H, um, but, but combat performance industry, you're here with DARPA, and this is this is the right place uh, that is that is clearly in scope. And so this is going to be important, uh, you know, point for for us to be working with DARPA to make sure that that we're we're deconflicting. But something that's combat performance is going to be um, solely up to DARPA to decide. Um, and it seems like it, that's also aligned with your conversation earlier. You know, sometimes there will be partnership opportunities. So something comes in the door at ARPA H, and you're working on it, and you see. Opportunities. Yeah, that's right. I mean, let's say prostheses or augmented realities in those in those cases. I mean, there there are civilian injuries that that can result, and so it's, it will be important for us to share information, of course. But um, but but something that is uh, DoD related. We'll yes. See what's ARPA. Okay. And this is our final question. Okay. Um, how holistic will the ARPA H approach be beyond disease to wellness? Yeah. So I, I again. Um, ARPA-H will be a reflection of the program managers and the concepts brought forward, but um, I, I think it's, it is important to demonstrate, especially early days of the organization, a diversity of approaches, um, whether from the diversity of the people that are running those, um, uh, being the program managers and running those experiments and the performers that they fund, diversity in, in geography. Um, that we bring forward to the organization. Diversity and experience, so, so the big levers in science and innovation, of course, are government um, and industry and academia, so making sure that that is reflected. And so if, we are, if we're touching on that, that diversity across organizations, I do think that we'll start to bring in more of a holistic approach from, from you know, each, each perspective that those organizations bring, but that is gonna be something, a drumbeat, that we'll definitely have in, in our page as we move forward. Okay, all right. Great. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for thank, your time. Thank you all. Thanks for the great questions. Um, and if, if people have questions, uh, do you, can you remind them one more time where to reach out if they're interested? Yeah, so we're still really small. So if you just send all your questions to careers at arpa-h.gov, we will get them. <laughs> all right, perfect. Great. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. <laughs>